Well, yesterday I finished up by talking about how that as Christians, we are involved in spiritual warfare. And one of the things I think is a misconception that many Christians struggle with is not understanding that, as A.W. Tozer once put it, the world is not a playground, it's a battleground. In fact, if you would indulge me, I'd like to really read uh, an excerpt from that sermon that he gave on that topic uh, back in the late 50s. And he entitled it just that. He called it a playground or battleground. It's interesting because as you read his, ob his comments and his observations, it seems like he was really prof prophesying about the direction the country is going because much of what he describes is where we find ourselves, unfortunately, in the church today. But here's what he wrote. Let me read it to you. He says, Going no further back than the times of the founding and early development of our country, we are able to see the wide gulf between our modern attitudes and those of our forefathers. In the early days, when Christianity exercised a dominant influence over Christian thinking, or excuse me, American thinking, men conceived the world to be a battleground. Our fathers believed in sin and the devil and hell, as constituting one force, and they believed in God and righteousness in heaven as the other. These were opposed to each other in the nature of them forever. They were opposed, their opposition was deep, it was grave, it was irreconcilable in its hostility. Our fathers had to choose sides. They could not be neutral. For them, it was life or death, heaven or hell, and if he chose to come out on God's side, he could expect open war with God's enemies. The fight would be real and deadly and would last as long as a life continued here below. Men looked forward to heaven as a return from the wars, a laying down of the sword to enjoy peace in, home, in the home prepared for them. Sermons and songs in those days often had a martial quality about them, or perhaps a trace of homesickness. The Christian soldier thought of home and rest and reunion, and his voice grew plaintive as he sang of battle ended and victory won. But whether he was charging into enemy guns or dreaming of war's end and the father's welcome home, he never forgot what kind of world he lived in. It was a battleground, and many were the wounded and the slain. That view of things is unquestionably the scriptural one. Allowing for the figures and metaphors which the scriptures abound, it still is a solid Bible doctrine that tremendous spiritual forces are present in the world, and man, because of a spiritual nature, is caught in the middle. The evil powers are bent upon destroying him, while Christ is present to save him through the power of the gospel. To obtain deliverance, he must come out of God's on God's side in faith and obedience. That, in brief, is what our fathers thought, and that, we believe, is what the Bible teaches. How different today. The facts remain the same, but the interpretation has changed completely. We are not here to fight anymore. We are here to frolic. We are not in a foreign land. We are at home. We are not getting ready to live, we're already living, and the best we can do is to rid ourselves of our inhibitions and our, and our frustrations and live this life to the full. This, we believe, is a fair summary of the religious philosophy of modern man, openly professed by millions and tacitly held by more multiplied millions who live out that philosophy without having given verbal expression to it. This change attitude towards the world has had and is having an effect upon Christians. Even gospel Christians who profess the faith of the Bible. By a curious juggling of the figures, they manage to add up the column wrong and yet claim to have the right answer. It sounds fantastic, but it is true. That this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted and practiced by the West, by the vast majority of evangelical Christians. They might hedge around the question if they were asked bluntly to declare their position, but their conduct gives them away. They're facing both ways, enjoying Christ and the world too, and gleefully telling everyone that accepting Jesus does not require them to give up their fun, and that Christianity is just the jolliest thing imaginable. 
The worship growing out of such a view of life is as far off center as the view itself, a sort of sanctified nightclubbing without the champagne and the dressed up drinks. This whole thing has grow, grown to be so serious of late that it now becomes the bounden duty of every Christian to re-examine his spiritual philosophy in the light of the Bible. And having discovered the scriptural way to follow it, even if to do so, he must separate himself from much that he formerly accepted as real, but which now in the light of truth he knows to be false. A right view of God in the world to come requires that we also have a right view of the world in which we live and our relationship to it. So much depends upon this that we cannot afford to be careless about it. Again, it was Paul who wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 1.27. He says, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I understand and accept wholeheartedly that this is not often an easy thing to do. But again, if we change our thinking, our perspective, our point of view, and we begin to look at our lives with all of its difficulties and problems and stop thinking, I shouldn't be having these difficulties, I shouldn't be having these problems, and realize that every warrior knows there's an enemy out there and he wants to kill you. And many Christians don't have that view of life. They don't realize that we have a real enemy. Peter goes on later on to say he's like a roaring lion trying to find those of us that he can devour. Have you ever watched a pride of lions pursuing a, a herd of wildebeest or antelopes in, the, in any of those uh, National Geographic documentaries that are so beautifully done? Have you ever noticed how that they pursue them and they finally they get one of those animals to break away from the safety of the pack? And when they get them isolated, then they fall upon them in force and destroy and kill them and then eat them. It's the illustration that Peter was well familiar with, living in a world that still had lions. And they were fabled in every culture of the world at that time. And he understood that this is what the enemy is trying to do. He wants to begin to load you down with guilt and shame and regret. He wants to get you to desire easier, safer, more comfortable times. <coughs> Excuse me. He wants you to be believe that life is supposed to be a playground and somehow your decision to follow Christ has robbed you of that fun and that frolic. <clears throat> but as I watch war documentaries, and I watch a lot of them, I find them fascinating and very instructive, and there's a great deal to learn from them. But as I watch them, I realize that every one of those men who went into battle, when they landed on beaches and far-off islands, or whether they charged into forests to face enemy tanks and gunfire, they understood there was an enemy out there with one intention, with one goal, simply to kill him and all of his comrades without mercy, without hesitation, and with lethal brutality. We need to understand that that's the kind of world that you and I live in, that we should expect that we're going to face opposition. We should expect that we're going to have people say things about us and be unkind to us. We should expect that there are people who will betray us and hate us, sometimes without any good reason for doing so. We should expect that and not walk around like wounded children who have, you know, bumped their knee and want mommy to kiss the boo-boo and make it go away. Instead, we should become mature and strong in our faith and realize that we have to stand fast, as Paul would put it in, in Ephesians 6. Stand fast. And he says, and af then after you've done everything you do, do, can to stand, then he said, stand. In other words, the idea of the Roman legions and the success of their warfare wasn't that they charged at the enemy with a wild and maniacal ferocity. In fact, the enemies often did that to them. They did just the opposite. They stayed in disciplined, calm composure. They locked their shields together, and so the enemy couldn't penetrate. They took their spiked sandals, their boots, and planted them in the ground firmly, and leaned forward against the coming enemy, and the enemy would crash against them. And they would do that over and over again. Usually it took about three ferocious attacks before the enemy began to give up. And then the Roman soldiers, in very calm 
and uh, strong discipline begin to step forward by command, inch by inch, inch by inch, until they literally just push the enemy off the field. We have to understand that's how we're to fight the battle. That's why Paul used the, the Roman soldiers often as an illustration. We're not running around crying and, and insanely yelling and making noise. We're not feeling sorry for ourselves and wanting to, to tend our wounds. What we want to do is we want to stand fast and hold our ground and endure hardships as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Because we know that if we hold our ground in due season, we will take the field. We will conquer the battleground. But if you think that the battleground is actually a playground, then you're going to suffer defeat after defeat after defeat because you're not looking at life and your life in it the way you should. Now, we'll continue on tomorrow. God bless you and go in His grace.